recording. Uh, how are you? I'm doing fine. All is well. It's uh, great. Out, so let me I'll reposition be a little bit, and I'll be all set. <clears throat> how are you doing? You guys doing all right over there? Yeah, we're doing all right. Um, you know, Fourth of July. Yeah. Did you do anything for the Fourth of July? Uh, we just um, we just made some food and yeah had, uh, yeah we had, didn't do anything so <laughs> yeah. you know whatever so. yeah listen to music and unfortunately uh, you can't really do barbecues or anything right now yeah yeah although your grandmother keeps talking about meeting in the backyard and stuff so yeah I, I, we need to sort of I need to explain to her that she's got to wear the mask and. Yeah, exactly. Oh, very important. Um, so uh, before we start, I just want to make sure that you're uh, that if there's any topics you don't feel comfortable discussing. Um, no, I feel comfortable discussing anything. I, I think I don't. We'll see. If I don't, I'll tell you at the specific topic. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, so uh, the first question actually doesn't really have to do with the Vietnam War, but um, I figured now was a really good opportunity to ask you because. You're a doctor of economics. Yeah. yeah. So um, across the country, small businesses are suffering from the impact of COVID-19, um, but it seems like a lot of large corporations are still flourishing. Um, what do you see a potential solution to this, or do you think this is a sort of apocalyptic end to small businesses? I think small businesses are going to have a very difficult time of it, uh, you know, getting through this, uh, this pandemic. Uh, and that's not necessarily the situation. It's a situation due to the policies of the, you know, the capitalist system and of government that, you know, are, they're, they're feeding some small amounts of money to the small businesses, but it's a restricted number. And, uh, just a lot of them aren't going to get that aid and aren't going to get enough to uh, continue on. And, uh, you know, what we have is we have a combined supply and demand crisis, which is pretty unique, uh, at least since the Great Depression. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it is not going to bounce back uh, very quickly. And I think a lot of small businesses are going to fold. The big businesses are able to respond. And uh, but many of them have gone under too. Uh, J.C. Penney, Neiman Marcus, a couple of others have, uh, maybe not Neiman Marcus, the other one, uh, whatever, one of them, you know, some of these big businesses are folding as well. Uh, so it's, you know, it's a very difficult time. And uh, no, I don't, I don't see, uh, you know, I, I don't see a direct solution that's going to be politically viable in this environment. Well, part of, uh, to me, what seems like the most egregious part almost is that some of the biggest businesses especially in new york city uh like um shake shack I, they're here too but uh they're all over the country um all ended up getting money from the government and yeah. it was obviously a limited amount of money the government could give out um anyway so um yeah if the, I was counting really small businesses, not like Big Shack, and, but they're, they're yeah they're giving money to the to the big companies, you know, and that's uh, you know that's what's happening. It's extremely unfortunate. Um, anyway, um, so you're extremely politically active. Um, yep. So. Do you think the countercultural movement spurred by the Vietnam War has had a progressive impact on American politics, or do you think it has had any impact? Or what, kind of, what are you referring to? The, I'm referring to kind of the um, the hippie movement, the civil rights movement, the uh, feminist movement, all of which sort of happened around that time. Okay, they. Um... The hippie movement, no. Uh, I think that sort of died out and, uh, you know, sort of came, became, you know, not unimportant. The civil rights movement was, you know, the 
the two, the twin aspects of what was going on in the Vietnam era was the civil rights movement in Vietnam. The civil rights movement far precedes uh, the Vietnam War. And, uh, you know, and it was when Martin Luther King, particularly, not only, but particularly tied the civil rights, the struggle for civil rights to the Vietnam War, that it became, uh, you know, it really merged and became a huge uh, uh, a huge thing. The civil rights movement obviously uh, did, uh, you know, make important advances for all uh, African Americans and other minorities, you know, that, uh, you know, at, at the time. I believe, uh, and the women's movement also, uh, you know, uh, in that period uh, took off as well. And uh, that both of those are important movements that uh, need to be fulfilled. Uh, need to continue to be fulfilled. Uh, you know, it's been uh, a rocky 50 years since then. And I won't, you know, I don't think there's any direct continuity of progressive kinds of things. There's a lot of people in struggle and, uh, you know, and people that recognize what needs to be done. And that's based in large part on what's already been accomplished in both the women's movement, the gay movement, the, um, uh, the civil rights movement, et cetera, from that period. I think that's very important. My thing, my thing about Vietnam, the, the real thing about Vietnam is that for me, it was the beginning of people really questioning and distrusting the government. You know, it came out, it was so clear that the government was lying and it came out with the Pentagon Papers and, and other things, that that to me was the beginning of uh, people not believing the government and starting to question. That too has gone back and forth, but it's developed over the last 50 years to where today, uh, you know, I'd say the majority of, uh, of people in the country do not believe what the government says on many, on most occasions. Well, or at least they're skeptical. Do you think that has to do with the fact that um, at that time, uh, television and uh, media was in people's home to a degree that it wasn't beforehand? So uh, Yeah, absolutely. And, and not only that TV was there, but that uh, they actually were showing the Vietnam War, uh, you know, firsthand on TV, and, and it was relatively uncensored, right? One of the one of the key things that's happened since then uh, is this whole idea of embodying, uh, em, yeah, embodying the press within the units. But they are they are controlling the press, uh, you know, and not uh, not showing uh, the kinds of things that happened in Vietnam. That was a direct response to the Vietnam War and to make sure that that didn't happen, because that obviously polarized the entire society. Uh, you know, at the time and led in large part to this not believing people would watch TV and see what was really going on. And then the government would say something else, you know, and and that caused uh, a lot of uh, questioning. Well, there was um, there were also a, a lot of films made during and after the Vietnam War about it. And yeah. I mean, I can say for myself, those definitely have had an impact on my perception, like movies like Apocalypse Now. Um, do you think those films do an accurate job of uh, portraying what happened, or do you think those are more fantasy movies that should be seen as uh, movies and not actual um, an actual documentation of what happened? Yeah, I, well, first of all, all the movies should be seen as as fantasy movies, you know. Yeah that have different levels of uh, reality, uh, you know, behind them. And, uh, and the different movies came out for different reasons. Uh, if you take uh, The Deer Hunter, came out in 1975, right after the war, that began the reformation of the story of Vietnam. That was a fascist piece of trash. I hated it at the time, and I hate it now. And it was, but it began this story of, uh, well, uh, the the soldiers were held back, and we could have won uh, if they hadn't put the shackles on the commanders, and the commanders were all dumb, and uh, the generals didn't know what they were doing, and that's why we didn't win the war. That kind of approach uh, 
uh, instead of this was a revolutionary war where people were fighting to free their country from a foreign invader and there was no way they were going to stop until the U.S. got out of there. That's the real story of Vietnam. No movie has really said that. None of them. Now, in terms of portrayal of what's going on on the ground, different aspects of different movies are very realistic. Um, Platoon, uh, in many cases, in most of Platoon reflects what I went through. Uh, Apocalypse Now, the part that people think isn't realistic is, and the part that they think is, isn't. The most realistic thing in Apocalypse Now for me, and I've watched it many times, is the combat assault. Uh, where the only thing that's really uh, the only things that are unrealistic are the playing of the uh, the the Valkyrie, the thing of you know the music, uh, yeah, and the, the surfers, Valkyries. Yeah, but the combat assault, how they actually conducted it, the helicopters coming in and everything else, were very realistic. And in fact, used my battalion call signs, and it was my unit that was shown going in there, and that really? was the actual visual. Oh was uh, pretty realistic. Um, Platoon reflects a lot of what I went through and a full metal jacket, the Marines like full metal jacket. Uh, it reflects more of the Marine experience. I can't speak to it, but that's, you know, they like that and, and feel that that's a more realistic uh, view. Um, the most realistic view of uh, the most thing that really put forth to me what it's like to be in combat is Saving Private Ryan, which is uh, set in World War II, but the first 20 minutes of that on on the uh, on Omaha Beach or whatever, and you know, in the D-Day, uh, shows the intensity of combat and what it was like, and began to portray the feelings you had, uh, you know, when you're actually under fire. So different movies have different points and make you know, and things like that. All of them are, uh, all of them have some reason for being made which may not be obvious, and all of them are, are uh, films. They're fantasies on, you know, in that first regard on some level. Right? Well, all of them are, are sort of um, a look at a real event through like a, a pop cultural lens. At the same time, right. um, there was a, a lot of music. Um, there, there was a, a big... Um, there were... Um, there was a shift in music in America, a lot of protest music. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so do you think, obviously, uh, the Vietnam War contributed to this music, uh, rock and roll music, to, you know, to the blues in the 1960s. Do, do you, what, what aspects of, of, um, of this music do you think uh, or, or what aspects of this music do you think was impacted by the Vietnam War and to what degree do you think it was uh, impacted? I think, yeah, I think a lot of it was. I mean, there are some that are extremely explicit uh, about uh, Vietnam, like war, what, what is, you know, what use is it or whatever that uh, song is, uh, you know, however it goes, war, you know, and, uh, and some others, you know, uh, are very clearly um, motivated entirely by anti-war um, uh, kind of activities and others more subtly. Um, we also have uh, a lot of uh, music that was affected by the civil rights movement at the time and, uh, you know, a lot of activity of, uh, of entertainers and stuff, both in civil rights and anti-war movement. I think that was uh, very important. And I think, you know, the cultural aspect of any struggle becomes very important, right? Uh, again, uh, less Vietnam and more uh, civil rights movement. You know, there's a lot of critique of how uh, African-American music was taken over and stolen by whites and, uh, you know, and, and uh, sold on that basis and a lot of money was made. But the carryover of African-American music to become national music was, I think, uh, a, a major aspect of importance in winning people over to the civil rights movement and moving it along. Same with the Vietnam War. I think, you know, there were aspects of it uh, that were 
um, anti-war and and motivated the movement, and, uh, you know, and played a very important role in that. Uh, and you know, it's still there's still an awful lot of '60s music that gets played around. <laughs> it's played sure, today, yeah. you know. Still yeah, popular the Who, the Beatles. Everybody knows the Beatles. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um. So, uh, so that the, this cultural shift was happening in America uh, while you were overseas. What aspects of the sort of cultural shift were you experiencing in Vietnam? Well, I think that uh, I'm getting a poor connection thing here. Uh, the, you know, the, the thing that affected me the most was, uh, actually in May of uh, 1970, it was about the day that the invasion of, uh, Cambodia began, which was, I don't know if you saw the news, May 4th uh, was the 50th anniversary. I spent all of 1970, 50 years ago in Vietnam. I came home for a leave and went on a on vacation, but I spent the whole year there. And um, what the same day was the day that I saw in the newspaper, the Stars and Stripes, that the people had been killed at Kent State, which was like May 2nd or something like that, two days before that. And, you know, my response at that time, what I felt at that time was, Jesus, this is get this shit is really getting serious, you know, and it raised it to a new level. So, uh, you know, that that was the kind of thing that impacted me. Most of what was going on in the United States, and we knew that there were protests and we knew things like that, but we really didn't get the, the news of that. What we got was the Stars and Stripes and we got some, uh, some radio stuff. Not that often. I didn't listen to that much uh, radio. Um, we didn't have really access to it. You had to be back on the fire base, certainly out in the jungle. You weren't uh, uh, listening to any of that kind of stuff. Um, what I looked at in the papers was uh, the, the Stars and Stripes. Every issue listed all the uh, people killed in action. And so I began to see how many people were being killed in action. And of course, I looked for my friends and uh, my class had the second most uh, uh, fatalities in Vietnam from, uh, you know, uh, in West, my West Point class, you know, of uh, there were two classes had 30. My, that was mine. And two classes, I think, had 33, uh, you know, that were uh, in Vietnam uh, just before us. So, um so that, you know, a lot of the social struggle in at home wasn't directly available to us, but we, you know, we got the news and we knew kind of what was going on. That was about it. It was, you know, there's a real disconnect. There's also, when you, you were talking about the music, there's also a real disconnect. A lot of stuff happened, started happening in 1970, late 69, 70 and um, 71, uh, the time I spent in Vietnam. And I didn't know anything about it. Uh, you know, uh, Elton John really came out, uh, not out sexually out, music in 1970. And I missed it. You know, a, when I came back, I was listening to more country music. And I was like, who's Elton John? You know, I, since then, I obviously, I heard a lot about him. And everybody else from that period knows all about him, but yeah. not me. You know, and uh, it wasn't until after I came home that I heard about Janis Joplin and uh, Joe Cocker and people like that that had really emerged uh, big time, uh, you know, in, in, in the period I was in Vietnam. So there was some isolation there from the social milieu that was taking place in the U.S. So, so for you, there, there wasn't the same, it, you didn't get the same view of pop culture that people in America did. So, oh, absolutely right. Now, there was a lot of anti war. There was discussion about the war in Vietnam, all right? Uh, the, we all, we talked about it, uh, you know, not, not in any great depth or, or anything else. I came home with two understandings. And, and one was, I think, pretty widespread. And that is everyone in my unit knew we were fighting everybody in the country. And if you, you know, except this tiny little group that was paid by the, the South Vietnamese government, 
And if you're fighting everybody and you believe in democracy, you're on the wrong side. That's the conclusion I drew. I won't say most people drew that, but everybody in my unit knew we were fighting everybody. You know, what the troops told me was, we go into a village and they put up the South Vietnamese flag. As soon as we leave, they pull it down and put up the North Vietnamese flag. That's the way people understood that, you know, the soldiers understood what we were doing. Um, uh, so I want to get back to sort of, we were talking about uh, the civil rights movement and the feminist movement earlier. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but I, I believe the Vietnam War was the first war where women were allowed to enlist. Is that correct? No, no, no. World War II had uh, women uh, nurses and, uh, you know, uh, and women have been in the military for a long time. Uh, uh, you know, they they played different roles. And there were no combat troops. No women were, were in combat. Uh, almost all of the women were uh, in medical nurse, basically nurses. And uh, there were probably some other logistical uh, positions that they took uh, in the rear. But there were very few women in Vietnam. The, most of the women, the women that we saw, besides nurses, uh, if you got wounded because they were in the rear, uh, were called donut dollies. And they worked for the USO, and they were there specifically to raise the morale of troops. Uh, and they wore these blue striped kind of uh, dresses. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's that's who we had contact with. But they weren't really in the military. They would come out and entertain the troops on one level or another and stuff like that. So you don't think the, uh, I mean, obviously the gender politics of the time, even though there, there was a, a second wave of feminism, it hadn't really reached, I guess still to this day, hasn't really reached the military. Uh, with that? Right, right. The, the military had, um, let me think, when I went to West, there's a bug. Uh, when I went to West Point, it was still all male. And it was uh, a number of years in the 70s until they admitted women. Uh, and the uh, women, uh, my wife was in the military. She's 20 years younger than I am, and she was in the military in the 1980s, and they still had the Women's uh, Marine Corps, uh, Women Marines and Women Army Corps. Uh, they hadn't integrated them into the, uh, into the different branches uh, of the military, like the infantry armor, uh, you know, signal, uh, and things like that. Today, at some point in the 80s, I guess, after long after I got out, uh, maybe even early 90s, they integrated women into more aspects, non-combat arms uh, of the uh, uh, military. And then ultimately, only in the last few years have they allowed them into combat ranger school and, and pretty much tried to equalize it across the board. Uh, that's the rules have tried to equalize it. There's been a lot of pushback by people, act, the men, actually, in the military. So you really were sort of, it was really mostly male, right? So it was all male, all male. Yeah. Um, so do you think, I mean, the, the term I hear a lot today is uh, toxic masculinity. I, do you feel like that affect you, affected you? Um, that sort of notion of, of um, hyper masculinity affected you in uh, that? No, you don't think that? I would. I wouldn't say that because, first of all, there were always people that did that that act men that acted like that. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I'm I'm not going to deny that. But most people, most people there were a scared, b. Uh, um, draftees uh, and C wanted to get through without getting hurt, you know, and uh, were very dependent on everybody else to make sure that that happened. And not everybody made it, but, uh, you know, that, that wasn't a hyper-masculine um, kind of situation. We did what we had to do. We were in combat and people fought, uh, but not, uh, you know, by the time I was there, uh, the war was uh, actually, uh, you know, they were starting to send troops home shortly after I got there. So people knew the war was winding down. 
uh, by 69, uh, you know, um, Nixon was the president and he had run on the thing of ending the war, which he didn't do for four years. But you know, we didn't know he was continually putting things off and he had started bringing troops home. So I didn't feel that there was it was obviously a very masculine uh, culture, but it wasn't the, the hyper masculinity that you're talking about. Yeah, there were some people like that there. Ah, let's go. Ah, 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 but and super military and super uh, anti-communist and, and, you know, and that kind of stuff. But that wasn't the dominant thing for me in any that I experienced in any way, shape or form. Well, so, um... everybody, everybody thought they were crazy anyway. Every, most of us thought they were nuts. Right. So, so that that's actually really interesting. So the, the, the sort of perception of masculinity was a little less extreme than I guess it's often portrayed and a little more positive than it's usually portrayed. Uh, yeah, a little more real. I mean, it, the idea that, uh, and, you know, and again, I haven't been in Iraq and Afghanistan or even in the Gulf War, you know, in, in the 90s, you know, but this idea that we're, that everybody is really into it and all that, that's part of the hype, right? right. I and, mean, you know, that, People come back from the troops I've talked to that come back from Iraq and Afghanistan are like, what the fuck are we doing there? You know, uh, you know, we shouldn't be there. We are harming civilians. And, you know, that's not that is not the hyper masculine kind of thing I see. The other aspect of this, I think, is very important is that the women that have gone into the military and this I don't want to make a general blanket generalization. But most of the publicity we see about the women have headed towards more of a macho kind of femininity than uh, than pulled the masculine toward the feminine. You know, uh, now that's probably, you know, that's a gross generalization, number one. And number two, it's probably going to be uh, mitigated over the years and there, we're going to see, um, you know, different attitudes. But uh, certainly. Um, the women that have gone through ranger school, for instance, are uh, hardly, uh, you, you know, bringing femininity into ranger school. You know, that, that ain't happening. So um, another question I uh, wanted to ask is, do you, I, I mean, obviously the Vietnam War had an impact on the general population's um, perception of Asians and Asian Americans. Did you see that, did, did, did you see a, a sort of racism and, and prejudice towards Asian Americans, even those who had nothing to do with Vietnam during the war? Uh, that's really hard to say. I No, I don't remember. Um, you know, the, the racism in Vietnam and by soldiers that I suppose had returned from Vietnam was terrible. It was really rampant. I mean, you know, one of the things that the military does is dehumanize the enemy. And, uh, you know, and that was that was absolutely rampant. And if you you went back to Fort Benning, which I did uh, with twenty five thousand uh, troops, almost all of whom were had returned from Vietnam, the racism was totally rampant. But when I got out and went uh, into the civilian world, no, I can't I can't say that. Um, most of the racism against Asians that I saw wasn't against um, um, Vietnamese or Chinese or Koreans, but it was against like the Indian population uh, that came over that spoke English. And well, I can't understand them. I saw teachers and the students would complain that they couldn't understand what they were saying, and uh, and you know kind of parlayed that into they don't know what they're talking about, which was absolutely untrue. Um, but no, I didn't see any major increase in racism against the Vietnamese. The, and there was, you know, there was a counteracting influence. The left, which was quite powerful back then, uh, actually, you know, uh, really raised the Vietnamese uh, Communist Party and the Chinese Communist Party to the a very high level and, and went sort of in the other direction of idealizing them in some ways that uh, probably weren't too accurate either. Uh, that's, you know, that was my experience. I don't know. Mm. Um, so the Vietnam War is often described as the television war. I've heard that a lot. Do you agree with that description? 
Yeah. Yeah. I, and I said, you know, they, that the military took dramatic moves uh, with this embedding and the whole the whole process of controlling the press after that to make sure that never happened again. Yeah, absolutely. It brought the brought the, the real view of what was going on into the people's living rooms and they were absolutely horrified. And that fomented a huge anti-war movement and a sentiment about it. And that, yeah, TV was crucial. And, um, and you mentioned that that contributed to a distrust in the government. Is there anything more you can say about that? Yeah, I think that's really grown. I think that, you know, the, the um, polarity that really developed of, uh, of what people saw on the one hand, and then uh, what the government was telling them, and then the uh, even if they they sort of believed, oh well, that's the you know that what we're seeing on TV is the local story, and and what the government is saying is the national story. Then the Pentagon Papers come out and reveal that everybody has been lying for years. I mean, out and out lying, you know. And uh, yeah, and that began the distrust of all of that together began the distrust of the government and, uh, uh, you know, in the, the questioning of, are they telling the truth? And that was, you know, that has developed continually up to right now, where you can see the level of polarity within the country today, uh, you know, and, you know, uh, one of the things, I mean, I think uh, to take uh, example of Trump has gotten out of hand completely, but, you know, toward the beginning, uh, that everybody was talking about Trump is lying. And my position was every American president since Kennedy, we have proof that they're all lying, right? I mean, they right. lie all the time, you know? And, and today I think more and more people are seeing that than fewer and few people, fewer and fewer people are, um, are taking everything that the government says at face value and recognizing it all as a political spin. If, even if it's, sort of the truth that it has a political spin and stuff like that and there's a lot less trust yeah it's even a little more extreme today because um there's no sort of unbiased walter cronkite kind of news political news it's all sort of it all has political spin whether it's fox news or msnbc at all is right. leaning one way and you'll have people on one side having a, a totally different story than people on the other side yeah. And of course, what we also recognize today is that Walter Cronkite had his biases, but it was much more in tune with the uh, general population than a lot of the politicians were. You know, he worked for the CIA and did some other things, you know, so, uh, he had his bias, too. But it was less obvious today then than it is today. I agree with you. He was really mainstream. I watched him all the time. Mm. Um, yeah. So my last question is. Um, what misconceptions about the Vietnam War do you think need to be cleared up um, in the public's perception now, almost 40, 50 years later? That it was a revolutionary war that, uh, you know, to establish socialism throughout and unify the country and that the United States was an invader and seen as a foreign invader, you know, into their civil war. Uh, to to defeat it. And I don't think that's generally recognized in those stark terms, uh, but I certainly think that's what people need to understand. And it's certainly the view of the Vietnamese. Mm. Well, thank you. That was, um, I got a lot of good stuff there. I'm, I'm going to stop recording now, but... Uh...